this day with Professor Alessandro Pinzani uh, with a speech on human rights and conceptual structures. Much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank Nika Mar for having had the initiative to organize the event and for having helped as a co-organizator uh, of the event, which is a joint venture between Uski, Uki and uh, Deutsche Wissenschaft and Innovationshaus. And I would like uh, also to take the chance to uh, thank you all for being here particularly the persons who came from very far away, from other parts of America, from Europe, uh, from Brella Pinera. So <laughs> thank you for being here. Uh, this event is possible because uh, of you, uh, of course. So, OK. Uh, let me start with a, with a methodological statement. The perspective for which I'm going to discuss uh, rights, actually more than human rights, so the titles not too precise, I mean, it's not precise in a sense. So the perspective for which I'm going to discuss rights is that of critical theory, but with a relevant target. In this paper, I am carrying out an exercise in social criticism more than critical theory. Now, usually, critical theory is associated with a strong tendency to make use of the findings of empirical research and to work interdisciplinary in order to engage in social criticism. However, I would like to make a terminological and conceptual distinction. This is nothing new. Critical theory is actually a theory about how a critical social theory should methodologically proceed. I think Nita might give a good example of critical theory work in this sense. And or about how social criticism should be carried out. As such, it is not necessarily bent on building a social theory, nor it carries out social criticism itself. A critique that is often advanced against contemporary critical theorists, also by some students of mine, is that they would indulge too much in methodological discussion instead of criticizing society. But in doing so, they are precisely doing what critical theory is about, discussing how critical social theory should be constructed or social criticism be carried out, not about criticizing society. As such a theory, it is universal in its nature, while social criticism is by its nature parochial, for it can only concern a specific kind of society, either with regard to its peculiarities or with regard to the common elements it shares with other societies. So I can criticize, for instance, neoliberalism or financial capitalism but this criticism will only hit certain negative aspects common to different societies without reaching deeper local roots for social injustice. If, for instance, followers of critical theory want to criticize the grammar of human rights, all what they can do is to show how the adoption of this grammar within a specific society is leading to unacceptable consequences, be they described as social <coughs> technologies, as forms of alienation, or as social suffering to quote familiar concepts, familiar to critical theory. This is always difficult for a philosopher since we tend to construct normative arguments that are general and abstract from empirical contingencies. My answer to this is that different empirical constellations lead to different diagnoses that call for different normative arguments. In this paper, I do not aim at criticizing the use of the grammar of rights in Brazil, Rather, I shall question whether it is the most adequate tool for social criticism in the specific context of Brazilian society, particularly with regard to the poor and the extremely poor, or better, to poverty and extreme poverty. At the same time, by discussing a specific case, one can learn something important about the general concept. In our cases, we could learn something about the very idea of rights that might get lost if we do not consider its concrete realization in specific social context. So I shall be oscillating between general theoretical remarks and parochial social criticism about Brazil, even from an empirical point of view. Final methodological remark. The starting point of social criticism consists always in some form of social suffering. Since my original title was Human Rights and Social Suffering, then went out of pervasive doctrine, then I decided to leave out pervasive doctrine because it is too complex a concept to 
response like and now is just a conceptual structures. So some form of suffering that might express itself loudly in the form of a social conflict or of a protest, etc., or that might require the ability of the social scientist to detect it. Think, for instance, of Alain Herenbert's Alain explanation of the social roots of depression. Social suffering is social in a double sense. It is experienced socially, that is, it is an experience shared by members of a specific social group, women, poor people, ethnic groups, LGBT people, etc. And it has social roots. So these two, two, two senses. I shall not discuss this concept here, but I shall refer to a specific form of social suffering in a moment. Identifying the social roots of suffering is not easy, for it presupposes at least the minimal theory of society, what society is, how society reproduces itself, how power is distributed within society, how individuals integrate into society, and a reconstruction of the ways a specific society, for instance the Brazilian one, works. So, of course I won't offer a full theory here, but uh, I will try to sketch uh, some idea that could lead to the development of such a thing. So, my proposal in this paper will be that we substitute the grammar of needs for the grammar of rights for the sake of such parochial social criticism. More precisely, I shall ask whether the grammar of needs is more adequate for carrying out social criticism in Brazil than the grammar of rights under present conditions. I am therefore restricting, restricting myself to contemporary Brazilian society. But I shall introduce some general concepts that might apply not only to other national societies, but also to other societal forms, from local communities to global society, if there is such a thing. Further, I am not going to criticize the very idea of rights, but just to question their role, not their soul, as tools of social criticism in this specific society. Nor am I establishing some conflict or competition between these, these two grammars, or worse, suggesting we abandon the idea of rights to coup. Quite on the contrary. In the final remarks on the book on the Bolsa Familia, I wrote with a sociologist colleague, we pleaded for the transformation of this minimal income program into a constitutionally granted right. Let us put it this way there are two possible narratives to explain social injustice. One that uses the language of rights, no matter how rights are grounded. Luigi Caranti gave us yesterday a, a full review, I would say, of how different they could be grounded. And no matter what their scope and status is, so whether they are conceived of as human or fundamental rights, as moral or legal rights, and Georg Lohmann gave us also a very interesting view about these topics. And, so this is one of the narratives. The other narrative uses the language of needs. I consider these narratives to proceed from different perspectives. While the grammar of rights is a moral one, <coughs> the grammar of needs is an ethical one. To put it different, rights allow for a moral criticism of society, for they represent claims that individuals or groups may rise against society and its institutions, for instance, the state while the definition of needs is connected to a certain view of what constitutes a normal or even decent life, at least within a certain social context. To use a familiar distinction, rights are concerned with justice, among other things, like dignity or autonomy, while the satisfaction of needs characterize a good life. Not necessarily in the full Aristotelian sense, of course, this is only a rough distinction that I am introducing just as a tool, an epistemic tool, let's say, or a heuristic tool, better, to build up my opposition. We will see that things are more nuanced. I mean, this is not such a dichotomy between these two I would like, furthermore, to contextualize this paper. As some of you might know, I was engaged for some years in a field research on the effects of the Bolsa Familia program on the subjectivity of its participants. And I am at present engaged in a similar research on the kind of social suffering experienced by extremely poor people in the Brazilian Northeast. For these reasons, my sociologist colleague, Joaquina Leonego, and I interviewed almost 200 women. 
Among other things, we discussed with them the way they perceived their own situation of deprivation. What struck us was the fact that they never blamed society for it, nor seemed to have developed some concept similar to that of social justice. They explained the situation, as well as the existence of poverty in general, as the consequence of individual fate, of bad luck, of personal incompetence, of lack of resources, in some case, of God's will. In no case, they blamed the rich or the powerful ones, although some will mention some corrupt mayor or official accused to be their personal enemy. It is only coherent that they will never consider receiving the Bolsa Familia or other kinds of public assistance as a right. As a matter of fact, only five women mentioned the word, but only one seemed to have an adequate conception of its meaning. So, just to make an example, once one of the women say, uh, yeah, well, uh, it is a favor of the government because I have a right. So, favor and right are the same. Uh, explaining the, the assertion. On the other hand, they all are, were, very well aware of what they lacked and recurred very often, almost in any case actually, to terms belonging to the constellation of needs. Going through needs, being in, lacking something. Portuguese, passar necessidade, ser necessidade, carecer de algo, this is consistent with many other empirical researchers that, by putting together voices of poor people from different countries, aim at constructing a common picture of the way the poor perceive and describe their situation. Interestingly, while only in some societies people mention their rights, mostly European societies, there are poor people also in Europe, also in Western Europe, 27% uh, of Londoners, one of the richest cities in the world, live beyond the line of poverty, the British line of poverty, which of course is higher than Brazil. So, uh, in all these societies under scrutiny, they mention their needs. So we have here a couple of uh, books, uh, you can see this India, uh, Uganda, uh, I think it's a colleague of you, in the Bacchereri University, Susanna uh, Bantega Fiumuendo. So what do these findings tell us? In the following, I shall firstly try to understand why the Brazilian women we interview do not speak of rights, and secondly, to draw some conse consequences for social criticism from the fact that they use the language of needs. The most obvious explanation for the absence of the language of rights in the discourse of the women we work with is that they lack civic education. That means they have not been taught about their rights, about the fact that, as Brazilian citizens, they have specific legal claims enshrined in the, 98, in the 1988 Constitution. This is, of course, correct, but does not explain why they do not consider the situation to be unjust. Why do they accept it as a given, or worse, as the result of their individual faults? One can give a very general explanation. One could, for instance, follow Hamet in his rehabilitation on the concept of reification, the book of 2005, and claim that these women are assuming a reifying posture toward themselves. This would mean that their personal experience of their situation and their explanation of the same situation are out of sync with another. For instance, they tell how their parents took them out of school very early and forced them to work, but then they blame themselves for the lack of education. They describe their ordeals in a search for jobs that would pay a decent wage, during which they face unscrupulous employers seeking to explore them, but they will justify the morally low wages they get by referring to their lack of skill, never blaming the employer's posture. In other words, they accept and reproduce an explanation of their situation that is not born out of their personal experience, but which they have received from the outside, from the media, or from the way in which poverty is discussed in the public sphere, in the Brazilian public sphere. So this would be the qualification explanation. In doing so, however, so in trying to uh, understand this uh, posture by recurring to 
tail is like uh, Honet's uh, idea of reification, we have to look at this specific discourse of poverty that is carried out within Brazilian society, but that is not present in other societies, where the poor blame social circumstances and of themselves for their condition. Italy, for me, would be an example. So if you speak with a poor person in Italy, normally this person would blame society or unjust conditions, not himself or herself. And we have also to understand why these women accept and reproduce this discourse instead of revolting against it and of producing an alternative one. Of course, these alternatives are produced, there, there is revolt in, in a sense, but in other contexts, so in some favelas, uh, have, uh, social movements of course, or um, within the social movement of landless Pisa, MBTS, but these are precise exception. So one would have to recur to some historical reconstruction of the way in which Brazilian society treated its poor during the five centuries of its existence. Or one should have to mention the social appetite that created an insuperable gap between the elite or the classes that perceive themselves as elite, so the 1% who thinks it's the 0.1%, <laughs> and the vast majority of people. Social and racial discrimination are only present in Brazilian society. I shall mention some examples that will allow me later introducing concepts such as material and conceptual structures. So just now a couple of empirical examples, just to go down from the high, from the level of theory. Till the recent introduction of social and racial quotas, access to higher education was restricted to the elite through the selection process called vestibular. Why investments in primary education are minimal because they were useless. The poor are considered to be too dumb, a commonplace often reproducing even among teachers. There is a vast literature over on this. And their only role within society seems to be that of constituting a reserve army of cheap labor force to be employed as domestic servants or for other manual jobs serving the higher classes. But maintaining wages for unqualified jobs extremely low due to the enormous reservoir of labor force they can draw from, the higher classes keep the lower classes just under or slightly above the level of past survival, making social mobility practically impossible so that their advantage situation is not threatened. This is justified by the widely shared view that unqualified jobs are worthless and do not deserve to be paid well, no matter how physically and psychically demanding they might be. Class segregation is omnipresent in everyday life. In shopping habits, the wealthy go to well-protected, socially segregated shopping malls, the poor go to commercial neighborhoods in dilapidated inner cities. And even in buildings, with the unsupport, insupportable distinction between social and service lift. To highlight the social apartheid that divides not only the rich from the poor, but members of higher classes from simple workers. So the cleaning lady, the delivery boy, the electrician are not worthy to share the same lift with the residents. Even before the law, inequality rates, not only informally, due to the fact that rich people can have lawyers while poor people have to rely on overwhelming public defenders, but also formally. During preventive prison, people with a bachelor degree receive a different treatment and do not share a cell with uneducated people. In all these examples, no legal right is violated. On the contrary, it is precisely the legal order itself that establishes these institutions and allows for these social practices. The fact that they have prospered for centuries and are still extremely powerful cannot be simply explained with reference to material difference in power. As Aaron convincingly argued, power cannot be based only on the brute use of force, on violence, if it wants to remain stable. It needs to convince of its necessity to those who are submitted. Once we grasp the mechanism through which people are led to accept the status quo, we can understand why the women we talk with not only do not question their condition, but consider it justified. But why would the use of the grammar of needs be more helpful than the grammar of rights in denouncing the situation? <coughs> Let me start with the restart, since I have already had a half of my presentation, by stating what I consider to be a crucial point 
from a descriptive, non-normative perspective. I do not think that justice, in the sense the word is used by most theorists, so in everyday sense also. And so I do not think that justice or decency are essential features of society. And I do not think that its absence would lead to the failure or to the end of a society. We have many historical examples of societies that might be considered to have been extremely unjust according to our present moral standards, since they were based on aggressive military expansionism and slavery, or practiced genocidal policies, or were grounded on a social hierarchy that damned the vast majority of members to serve a minority. Things become different when it comes to the satisfaction of needs. Independently from a society distributing the corresponding satisfiers fairly or justly or not, even within a society based on slavery, individual needs have to be met, at least to the extent that guarantees the functions of the system. Slaves have to be fed, for instance. Insofar, the fact that a given society satisfies certain basic needs does not say anything about its character as a decent, fair, or just society. At <coughs> most, it says something about its being a more or less well-functioning society. We can claim, therefore, that any given society, even the more unjust and unfair, must guarantee the satisfaction of certain human needs. And notice, this is not a normative claim. So I'm not saying that it ought to guarantee. It must. Second, one does not have to recur to a list of objective needs, like most need-centered theorists tend to do. You have a list, just a short list, there are more. Needs need not to be considered as something that has to be defined objectively one and for all. Although some needs are indeed common to all humans or even to all, to all living beings, like the need for adequate nutrition. However, every human society defines needs differently, establishes which needs must have their satisfaction granted by social institutions, takes responsibility for offering the corresponding satisfiers, and allows for their satisfaction in different ways and levels. To make a trivial example, even the satisfaction of the mentioned basic need for nutrition has to obey to certain restraints. Most societies forbid that one consumes human meat. Some forbid the consumption of other kinds of food, like pork, shrimp, etc. Needs are therefore social defined. So you don't need to have an essentialist theory of human being in order to define the needs. The needs are defined socially. They have intrinsically intersubjective social character. <coughs> In this, they differ from preferences that are merely subjective. Sometimes, some theories confound these concepts. As such, they are from the very beginning a possible object of social conflict and even social struggle with regard to their definition and social satisfaction. This is an aspect they share with rights. Defining needs and establishing the legitimate ways of satisfying them constitutes, therefore, a main task of every human culture and of any human society. The gamut goes from societies a la Mad Max, I'm referring to the old movie with Mel Gibson, not to the bad remake that was not like all remakes, they're always bad, in which the only needs whose satisfaction societal life tries to guarantee are survival and safety from enemies, so a cohesion society, to the Scandinavian model of welfare state, in which the range of needs the state, the state provides for may be very broad. By defining its task with regard to the satisfaction of needs, society is offering a justification of its own existence and therefore stating the legitimacy of the status quo. It explains why power is held by certain social actors and exerted through certain social institutions. It establishes the criteria through which social positions are distributed. It determines which individuals shall have their needs satisfied. Mostly, it is just a member of society. And we had this discussion when, to, when we talk about migration in these days. This is a crucial point. Society cannot do without this legitimacy discourse on the long term. Most societies in history were based on the exploitation of a majority to a minority. The nominal elite might be, could be, might be constituted according to the kind of society by warriors, priests, scholars, blood aristocrats, slave holders, owners of the mean of production, or of a mixture of some or of all these categories. Nevertheless, bear force were rarely considered to be a sufficient resource for justifying the primacy of the dominant elite, at least 
in most historical societies. Every society recurred and still recurs to some legitimacy discourse in order to justify its inner organization. For instance, in order to justify the dominant position of its elite. I shall not refer to this discourse as to an ideology. This term indicates, in my opinion, an intentional attempt at misleading people. Those who carry it out do not believe themselves in what they are defending. I'm not denying that ideological discourses might be widespread within society. I think we are hearing a lot of it now during this campaign. But they do not account for the whole of the possible justifications of the status quo. Those who defend the moral inferiority of the poor within Brazilian society do really believe in this idea, as shown by the fact that even the poor can share it. So it is not ideology, it is something different. What is this? We can claim that what allows for social reproduction is the interplay of a material structure, that is, the network of concrete relations of force and power on the one side, and on the other, a conceptual structure that explain and justify such relations. This is a very complex uh, uh, concept. Uh, I won't discuss it now, but if you want in the discussion, I can try to uh, explain what I mean with conceptual structure, which is a term that Parcher borrowed from Karin Ward. Uh, so, Every society has a material and conceptual structure of its own, although complex societies tend to get caught in a network of power relations that goes beyond the natural borders, the national borders, becoming so more or less integrated in an international or global material structure. Parenthesis, this tends to provoke a legitimacy crisis, since this process of integration in a wider material structure is seldom accompanied by the necessary development of the corresponding concept, conceptual structure, so the legitimacy discourse. And the increasing success of nationalist populism in Europe and worldwide might be explained by this lack of synchronicity. End of parenthesis. This means that the majority of the members of a society are not only submitted to its material structures, to the way power is distributed and exerted within it, but accept its conceptual structure and act consequently. And this results in social integration from the individual point of view and in social reproduction from the point of view of society as a whole. This means that there is always a normative dimension ingrained in social structures and practices. This aim at being considered legitimate and mostly do so by pointing to the fact that they allegedly satisfy certain needs that are considered to be central according to the dominant social and ethical values. <coughs> Legitimacy discourses are based on these values and on the claim that social institutions and practices do realize them in practice by guaranteeing the satisfaction of the corresponding needs. So, it is society itself who creates the ideal that it claims to be realizing or at least to strive to conform to. This is also an old idea of critical theory. Also there is therefore a normative perspective that is already implicit in any legitimacy discourse and that allows for an internal or immanent, I will use these two words as synonymous for now, also for this paper, uh, so that allows for an internal or immanent form of social criticism. This can happen, and I am now using a, a tripartition introduced as far as I know by Rahel Yeti. This can happen from a merely instrumental perspective. Society is criticized for not being effective enough in following this ideal. Or it can happen from a moral perspective. Society is accused to intentionally neglect its duties and or even to discriminate against the needs of a specific social group. This criticism adopts often the language of rights and denounce their violation by social institutions. Finally, social criticism can happen from an ethical perspective. In this case, the very idea that society claims to be pursuing is criticized because it's criticized because it leads to a form of social life deemed unacceptable or bad. Accordingly, social sphere to fulfill its task of helping its members to satisfy their needs can be perceived as being either merely the result of society's incapacity or impossibility to fulfill its task. This is the object of functional criticism. So functional criticism say, well, we could do better, 
but the ideal is still working being pursued, or uh, as being a form of deliberate inaction and even of active discrimination, this is the object of moral criticism, so there is a violation of certain rights, for instance. Or, as the unavoidable consequence of following an inadequate idea. And this is the object of ethical criticism, and in my opinion, this should be also the perspective of a social criticism starting from a perspective of critical theory. It is in the two latter cases that normative demands rise, since one is facing not just uh, with, uh, with some practical ineptitude on the part of society, but with what fully deserves to be called social injustice, although for different reasons. One moral criticism focuses on the injustice done by some, done to some member of society, and ethical criticism aims at the very way in which society understands itself and its ideals. A moral criticism can fully accept the dominant legitimacy discourse and use it to attack illegitimate discrimination. Like when, for instance, the principle of merit is invoked against the distribution of social positions based on wealth, family ties, or other non-meritocratic criteria. An ethical criticism would question the very principle of merit, the worldview it is based on, and the practical consequence it leads to. While moral criticism accepts the dominant definition of society's tasks and, task and duties, ethical criticism cast doubts on this definition and suggests that one redefines society's priorities and the way it understands its own task. So I'm not now claiming that the grammar of right, being a moral grammar, necessarily led to a moral criticism that accept uh, the description that society gives of itself. But there is a risk. Brazilian society does not legitimate the status quo by according to the grammar of rights, although at some time it uses the corresponding language, like in the 98. The 1988 Constitution. So they talk of rights, but what they grant is not rights, but it's privilege. So this is the difference between the grammar or language. The systematic violation and neglect of the rights of the vast majority of the population, we had uh, an impressive example of this in Rebani's thought tomorrow, today, are not simply an expression of material domination, of the brutal use of force, for instance, of police or military force. Of course, they are also this. They are conceptually grounded. The dominant classes see it as justified, if not legally, at least factually, by the necessity of protecting the rights, actually the privileges, of the so-called good citizens, citizens de bene. The dominated classes are used to it since 1500 AD, that is, since the establishment of the colony, which was based from the very beginning on mass killing and slavery of non-white population. 350 years of slavery have created a society in which privilege prevails on right, even among the dominant classes, in which power is naturally exerted vertically according to a strict unchangeable hierarchy. The same families form the economic and political elite since centuries or decades. Santa Catarina is also a good example. The very conceptual structure of Brazilian society justifies the violation of rights or puts aside the grammar of rights, blocking the way for an immanent moral criticism that be not the top down enterprise. However, this structure promises the satisfaction of needs to all hardworking members of society. This does, in fact, anger for people. The language of rights does not resonate with the women we call the weak. They were not taught this language. They do not claim their rights, but they speak the language of needs, although they do not question the legitimacy discourse of Brazilian society who claims to reward hard work. On the contrary, we heard a constant lament. We work so hard, we work so much, and yet we have nothing to, we have nothing to eat, we have nothing to hope. These kind of complaints open up the possibility for an imminent ethical criticism that might proceed bottom up, hearing the voice of the dominated without looking at their situation through the lens of a social theorist equipped with normative concepts they do not share or even understand. This criticism should avoid falling into a merely instrumental criticism, for instance, claiming that Brazilian society fulfilled its promise to reward individual merit, and should call into question the very idea of merit, showing its untenable character, 
its emptiness when applied to the distribution of social position within a society marked by inequality and class, race, and family privilege. This could represent a starting point for questioning the conceptual structure of Brazilian society, an operation that I deem essential to start dismantling its material structure. Thank you for your attention.